Let's go ahead and get started. It's a couple minutes after 12. Um, I want to welcome you to the latest um, in the Humanity and Health webinar series. Um, this is a series um, at the University of Oklahoma, supported by the Office of the Vice President for Research and Partnerships and other colleges and units on uh, both the Norman and the Health Sciences campuses. Uh, this particular webinar is called Literature and Medicine, How the Humanities Can and Should Contribute to Healthcare Training. Uh, my name is Kathleen Crother. I'm in the History of Science, Medicine, and Technology Department, and I'll be <coughs> moderating this. Um, our two presenters are Dr. Jerry Vanetta and Dr. Ron Schleifer. Uh, Dr. Jerry Vanetta, who will um, start off, is a retired internist. He taught for 40 years um, in the faculty of the College of Medicine at OU. Um, for, and for six years, he was the dean the College of, of Medicine. Um, he's, he says he's retired, but he also tells me that in his retirement, he's established a PA program in Oklahoma City. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Ron Schleifer is a professor of English at OU. He's been teaching English for 45 years um, at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, Dr. Schleifer and Dr. Vanetta have been... <coughs> excuse me, collaborating um, on uh, topics related to kind of literature and medicine for the past 20 years. Um, and uh, Dr. Schleifer has a number of their, their books that he will show you. Um, they also told me right before this that the, they've taught a course on literature and medicine together, and uh, they're very proud of the fact that all five Rhodes Scholars um, from OU have taken that class, and some of them went on to Oxford to um, study literature and medicine. Um, so I will um, hand the floor metaphorically over to um, uh, Dr. Vanetta, and uh, you can go ahead and get started. Thank you, Dr. <clears throat> well, I came to this interest in uh, literature and medicine actually in the clinic. I was uh, seeing a woman uh, in my practice um, in about mm, probably 1990, 1991. Um, I was seeing a woman, an 87-year-old African-American woman who we had had in the hospital and I was seeing her in follow-up. I went in and sat down and, and uh, we, we had known each other in the hospital, but I got started with the interview and fairly quickly re realized that nothing was connecting. Uh, I was not connecting with her. She wasn't connecting with me. It seemed to me like she wasn't very interested in being there. So I stopped the biomedical medical interview and I said, you know, I didn't get to know you real well while you were in the hospital. Um, why don't you tell me about your life? She's an 87 year old woman. So she has a lot to choose from. And here's what she told me. When I was, she said, I was, I grew up in East Texas. Uh, my father was a sharecropper. And when I uh, was 15, I wanted to marry a 16 year old. And my daddy made me marry a 21 year old because he was a sharecropper too, and he could make a living. And together we had 17 kids. And then she looked at me and said, he was really good at making babies, but not so good at making a living. And I was, I was blown away by that phrase. Then she chose to tell me that she commonly walked two miles to a man's house to do work and two miles home on a daily basis. And he, he would commonly give her a dozen eggs or two gallons of milk, and she would carry that home walking two miles. And I imagine her in East Texas on a caliche dirt road, walking to and from this place of employment uh, with not such good shoes on, um, maybe rocks in the road, maybe bruised feet, 
carrying this two gallons of milk. And immediately, as I'm imagining that, my mind found a paragraph in a novel I had read six months to a year earlier, Beloved by Toni Morrison. And in that paragraph, protagonist Setha is uh, pregnant and running from slavery in North, North Kentucky, trying to get to Ohio. And she's about to deliver a baby and her, she's up under a bush and another uh, runaway begins to help her deliver this baby. But the paragraph describes her feet. And I remembered this, these swollen red blistered feet uh, on Setha. And um, somehow by remembering that, my countenance must have changed in the room. The patient, at about that time began talking and giving me the, the story she wanted me to know uh, with much more enthusiasm and much more engagement. And following that story, we went on to discuss her cardiovascular problems and her medications and so forth. I then did the physical exam and, and uh, stepped out of the room for her to get dressed. And when I came back in, she stood up and she put out her arms and uh, we embraced. And she said, Doctor, I, I really like you. I'm gonna come back and see you again. Now this embracing and this business was very, very uncommon in my practice, but um, I left the room and I thought, you know, the thing that made the connection between me and that patient was the novel Beloved. And that's the reason that we have been telling people who go to medical school, take a real broad based undergraduate education. Um, and uh, I wanna do something about this in medical education. And so I set about trying to figure out how to, um, how to do that. I put together a curriculum. I, five or six years later, was introduced to Ron Schleifer. And Ron and I sat down and we, we agreed that this needed to be done. He showed me uh, quite, quite frankly, quite quickly, what was wrong with the curriculum I had created. And we had a curriculum ready to go within an hour. And um, uh, we created something that I quite th frankly think neither one of us could have created individually. And it's a, it's a wonderful, life-changing, uh, interdisciplinary project. Ron? Great. Is it time for me? I'll, I'll start with the story also, but not quite as, as heartwarming as Jerry's story. Uh, a, a few years after we started teaching together, uh, I had the opportunity of teaching literature and medicine by myself at Colorado College. Uh, uh, in that time, Jerry and I and our colleague, Sheila Crow, had put together a DVD-ROM called Medicine and Humanistic Understanding. There's an image of it. Uh, and what we did in this DVD is we went around the country and interviewed a large number of physicians uh, who were interested in the humanities. So I was able to teach this class by myself and have videos of physicians. So it was as if I were team teaching by myself. After a couple of weeks of this class, a young woman came to my office seething in anger. She said to me, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to make literature practical. Uh, and, and, uh, and in literary studies, it's still true in many areas, uh, uh, practicality hasn't always been the most important feature. Uh, uh, so what makes literary studies practical? Um, uh, there's a, a, a woman doctor in New York, Dr. Rita Sharon, who also went back to school and uh, got a PhD in literary studies. And she wrote a wonderful book entitled Narrative Medicine. 
And in this book, she talks about the ways that narrative can enhance medical practice. At one point, she says this, I'll just read a short passage from her book. She says, training for close reading in literary texts is not unlike training for more clinical kinds of reading that health professionals assimilate. If I were to put a normal chest x-ray up on the view box, any doctor would say something like the following. This is well-penetrated, non-rotated film. The inspiration is adequate. The bone structures are unremarkable, et cetera, et cetera. The reader has learned to pay attention, the x-ray reader, to various features of the visual text. In a similar fashion, we can teach students what features of narrative are most likely to capture uh, the information of an image, what aspects of storytelling most fully we pay attention in terms of understanding, engagement, and developing the best possible actions uh, uh, for the situation of storytelling. And storytelling, as Jerry's anecdote reminds us, is at the heart of clinical medicine. Uh, uh, Jerry's told me over the years, so he'll, he'll say again tonight, that the most important information a doctor receives is, for, is the patient's story. And so part of what literature can do is, um, uh, is uh, help people become better listeners, uh, healthcare workers. Uh, uh, I've, we've done a lot of work for, over the years on neurological studies. It turns out that um, the basic pro, uh, brain process, the, ba the brain processes images um, prompted by literature in much the same way that it processes other images. One study I came across described the way uh, uh, our bodies react when we focus on a, a painting. And one thing that occurs is there's what's called sarcadic eye movement where the eyes involuntarily move from focal point to focal point while somebody is engaging in visual attention. Well, it turns out the eyes move the same way when somebody reads an image in, in, in a literary work. And then that's sort of uh, just a, a remarkable uh, uh, event of the way that studying literature can create experiences for people in, 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 in the world. Um, uh, another book we've done together is called Literature and Medicine. And it's a text anthology of literary works in the context of clinical problems. Um, uh, maybe the star of the book is Anton Chekhov. Uh, he's the only person in the book who appears twice. Chekhov, as, as probably we all know, was both a doctor, a short story writer, uh, and um, a, a great playwright in Russia in the early 20th century. Uh, uh, when we teach this class together, we use three of the stories. In the book, we only have two. The first of the stories we talk about is a story called The Lady and the Dog. Uh, the novelist Vladimir Nabokov claims that The Lady and the Dog is the best short story ever written. Uh, I myself think it's up near the top. Uh, the, the two other stories we, and, oh, and what's interesting about this story when we teach it, by the way, is it's not about medicine in the same way that Beloved is not about medicine. What, what it's about and what Chekhov is, is brilliant at, as is Tony Morrison, is in being able to represent and give us the feeling of close interpersonal relationships. That's what happened in the clinic for Jerry. That's what happens when we read novels and short stories. Uh, um, the, the, the two uh, stories of Chekhov's in our book is one is called The Doctor's Visit and another is called Enemies. And I, I thought I would just, let me find it for a second. Uh, uh, I thought I'd just read one passage from Chekhov's book, um, if I can find it. Uh, uh, it's a uh, Chekhov's story. It's a story about a doctor whose young child has just died within the last hour and he's filled with grief. And an aristocrat comes to his house because the aristocrat believes his wife is dying. And she insists that the, um, the doctor could come to the house to take care of his wife. And after a long time, the doctor interrupts his grief and goes to visit the aristocrat's home. And they discover that the wife wasn't dying. She wanted to get her husband out of the house so she could run off with her lover. Uh, and, and the doctor is outraged that his grief and the grief of his wife has been interrupted by this kind of aristocratic privilege. Uh, and here's how Chekhov describes their conversation after this is all found out. 
With tears in his eyes, trembling all over, the aristocrat Aubergine opened his heart to the doctor with perfect sincerity. He spoke warmly, pressing both hands on his heart, exposing the secrets of his private life without the faintest hesitation, and even seemed to be glad that at last these secrets were no longer pent up in his breast. If he had talked in this way for an hour or two and opened his heart, he would undoubtedly have felt better. Who knows, if the doctor had listened to him and had sympathized with him like a friend, he might perhaps, he might perhaps as often happen, have reconciled himself, the doctor, have reconciled himself to the trouble, his trouble without protest, without doing anything needless and absurd. And what Chekhov captures here are moments of human interaction, which students can see and participate in when we read about them. It, it, uh, it's it's uh, a, a wonderful, um, to my mind, a, a wonderful story. Um, so let me just close with a paragraph from, the, from another book Jerry and I wrote called The Chief Concern of Medicine. Here's where the title comes from. Uh, when we go to the doctor, the first thing they write down in our charts is our name and address. The second thing doctors write down is what's called the chief complaint. And in, in our country, in the United States, doctors are enjoined to write it down in the words the patient speaks. Uh, I've had a headache eight out of 10 for the last three weeks. That's a chief complaint. And, and they write that right down. What we do in our book and what Jerry helped to establish at, at the Health Science Center is a new protocol for the interview. After you ask the patient about their chief uh, complaint, ask them about their chief concern. What concerns you about this headache? Somebody could say they'll lose their job. So they can say they won't see their kids graduate. They can say uh, uh, they'll lose their partner, but whatever they say is something the doctor can't know. And so what this creates is a moment where the doctor has to listen to the patient and make sense out of the story, the way that, uh, again, Jerry made sense out of his patient's story. Uh, it, also, it also gives the physician, by asking the chief complaint, uh, the chief concern, it also gives the physician usually an emotional content that he, that he or she can use to empathize with what brought them to the physician. And in, in this way, what we're hoping to do is by asking what the chief concern is, as well as the chief complaint, is habituate the need and the ability to empathize with the patient's suffering. Okay, thank you. So let me uh, finish my few words with a paragraph from the book that Jerry and I wrote together, and then a clip from our DVD. But here's what we said near the beginning of the book, The Chief Concern of Medicine. The privileged narratives of literature, like caring for people in ill health, are a central aspect of all human communities. In fact, there's a wealth of evidence in evolutionary cognition that narrative organizations of, of meaning are inherited strategies of understanding in human experience. People tell one another stories just as they care for the health and well-being of one another. And such stories telling, like practices of healing, is everywhere taken to be sacred and honorable and important, a special gift that is part of our human inheritance. Like healing in healthcare, the power of storytelling is often taken to be mysterious. As Anatole Broyard says in his posthumous book, Intoxicated by My Illness, quote, all cures are partly talking cures. Every patient needs mouth to mouth resuscitation for talk is the kiss of life. This description of talking cures referring to Sigmund Freud's early description of his medical practice, emphasizes the fact that while medicine often aspires to be an exact and methodological science, it is simultaneously engaged at the level of person-to-person -person encounter in a manner similar to the person-to-person -person encounter that narrative storytelling enacts and literature often provokes. This real life engagement in medicine, like the representations in literature entail honor, imagination, and value that the humanities attempt to comprehend in the goal-oriented understanding of narrative. 
So this kind of summarizes the goal of the work of the, of the, of the health humanities. Um, to, to end this opening presentation, I'd like to share with everybody a clip from our DVD of Dr. John Stone, a cardiologist who's, who's also an important poet. There's no sound, Ben. Thing is going to be all right. Uh, one of the great functions of the physician is to say those few words to the patient from time to time when they're true. When I when I first came to Atlanta, I uh, was assigned to uh, a congenital heart disease clinic, rheumatic heart disease clinic, and I would go and see these little kids having been trained as an intern, at least sometimes infants, or certainly adolescents. And I would hear, as the stethoscope went to the left lower sternal border, I would often hear a groaning, musical, short, systolic murmur like, hmm, hmm. This is an innocent murmur. And you can know it by its location and its qualities. And one of the great things was to be able to say to the mother, usually, everything is going to be all right. Carrying the good news is, is at least as important as uh, carrying the bad news. Uh, I, let me just see if I can say this Derek Mann poem. Everything is going to be all right by Derek Mann. How should I not be glad to contemplate the clouds clearing beyond the dormer window and the high tide reflected on the ceiling? There will be dying. There will be dying but there is no need to go into that. The poems flow from the hand unbidden and the hidden source is the watchful heart. The sun rises in spite of everything and the far cities are beautiful and bright. I lie here in a riot of sunlight, watching the day break and the clouds flying. Everything is going to be all right. Now, that is a poem that I can carry with me in my back pocket against any uh, adversity that might come across my pathway. I'm that's trying a, to. That's a wonderful poem. Um, it, it's my favorite poem uh, in, in our DVD, and it's my favorite because. Um, uh, because it brings such hopefulness to medicine. Uh, much of what we talk about in class has to do with distress and suffering and unhappiness. And one of the things we want to remind our students that there's also this graceful uh, um, goodwill involved. Well, I, I want to pop in here to uh, say that if uh, members of the audience have questions, if they could please put them in the Q&A function at the, um, it's found down at the bottom of the screen um, on the far right side, the Q&A function. I'm gonna look at that. Um, but as I don't see anything there right away, I, I'm actually gonna um, start out by asking both of you um, to talk in maybe a little more detail about kind of how, um, how this training looks, um, particularly if you're training medical students. And I know we had a brief conversation before this about um, studies you've done on the effectiveness of um, this training in, in, in the humanities and how it changes uh, people's practice. So maybe if you could speak a bit to that. I might start by saying that uh, what Ron and I did was form an interdisciplinary course and put it in the Honors College in Norman. And we taught it one year, and then we then we uh, went to the Health Sciences Center and offered it to students who had finished the first year before they took the second. And we had 15 or 20 uh, medical students who took that course. Um, I then started a course, uh, a senior elective. Um, but in 2010, the medical school decided to redo their curriculum. And I saw the opportunity at that time to engage with the curriculum committee who was redoing the curriculum 
and ask them to um, put together a medical humanities uh, curriculum that was required. And so currently we have 10 courses uh, that every medical student has to take. Uh, they have to take at least one of them uh, in the sophomore year uh, in the medical humanities. Uh, because um, I spent my entire career as an academic, every time I got involved in some new uh, project, I wanted to study its effectiveness and its outcome. And so we did a study at the medical school of the effectiveness of those courses. Um, and we did a qualitative uh, study. And basically what we found out was that the students um, uh, felt like the things that they got out of taking the humanities courses was this is something much more than the science they had been teaching, that, um, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, um, that they um, learned, that they learned that uh, suffering was very, very important in the practice of medicine on the part of the patient. Um, and that they learned that um, one of their major jobs uh, was to uh, empathize with the suffering that was going on. These, th these similar categories showed up in the, we did a study on uh, physicians who had taken the literature and medicine course in Norman and were then are now in practice. And so this is a longitudinal study and uh, we found very similar categories. Uh, we did a study of the, of the effectiveness of the humanities curriculum at the PA school at OCU and found uh, very similar categories. So it seems to be fairly stable um, in terms of different groups of students that we've studied. Jerry didn't quite mention that first course we taught, taught up at the Health Science Center, the students got together and ended up starting a literary magazine called Blood and Thunder, uh, which has been published since uh, for the last 20 years, really, which publishes stories, narratives, uh, poems written by people involved with healthcare. And, and the reason they did this, we've seen this year after year, uh, um, these students mostly uh, uh, trained in um, biomedicine come to class. And if we're teaching in the fall and start in August, in October, the light bulbs start going off. Uh, the people are realize, come to realize, not everybody, but a lot of people come to realize there's more than one way of thinking about the world. Uh, and, and, and the other way um, 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 allows them to do the things we've been talking about this morning, which is to, uh, uh, to empathize and, 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 and interact with, with other people in, in richer ways. I think one of the things that they, that, that where the light bulbs start coming on in October is that they've spent their, their lives since age 10 to 14, uh, I want to go to medical school. How do you do that? You make A's, you take science courses, and they've been focused on that. And one of the things that dawns on them in October after having started this course in, in August is that there's a tremendous amount of vicarious experience that can be gained from great literature that they've not been exposed to. And Quite frankly, that's what happened to me. The vicarious experience of Setha's life was so similar to the life of the patient that was presenting to me that I could connect to it. So I see a um, question in the question and answer about, um, well, I think, I'm 
going to read it because I'm not sure all the participants can see it. Um, I know you guys can see it. This is a great presentation. Earlier, it was mentioned that the literature can assist in training students to understand how to connect with the patient and also think about pain, treatment, medicine, suffering, etc. Beloved by Toni Morrison was mentioned. At its core, it is a narrative of healing and provides a blueprint for healing. Do you have units or discussions of healing in your courses? Well, it's a great question. Uh, um, the answer is the whole is about healing. Uh, I, I, um, I, I just finished my, uh, a book I wrote in, entitled um, uh, 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 Literary Studies and Well-Being. And the term well-being is a term Jerry and I talk about in, in The Chief Concern of Medicine. It's a translation of Aristotle's notion of eudaimonia. Uh, Thomas Jefferson uses it when he says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness is eudaimonia. And what it is, 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 to, um, uh, is, is to develop for yourself and for those around you uh, um, uh, the fullest lives you can. Uh, uh, it's, it's a vague term, but an important term. And one of the things the literature and medicine class does is make that notion of happiness or well-being a, a central part when people take the trouble to care for one another. Uh, another way of thinking about it is that the medical students are so focused on um, on the treatment, it's pharmacology, it's surgery, it's x-rays, it's, uh, it's, it's scientific, that one of the things that study in the humanities does is bring forward, like Ron just stated, this business of caring for the person, which is a, a necessary, a necessary, um, a, a, part of the healing process. Is there, um, you spoke of teaching um, uh, physician's assistants as well. When did you, well, I, I actually, I, I guess I was wondering about other, not just physician's assistants, but nurses um, and other medical professionals and the extent to which, you know, you think, um, everyone in medicine could benefit from this kind of training um, and whether that would look different for different kinds of practitioners. Well, I, I do agree with you that everyone who is face-to-face -face with patients um, in, the, in the healthcare industry could benefit from this kind of education. Uh, um, whether it's being done in uh, nursing schools and pharma pharmacy schools, I, I don't know. I haven't done any research regarding that. Um, but when I was asked to help start this PA program uh, at Oklahoma City University, I said, I'll only participate if you will agree <laughs> to put a humanities curriculum in, in the 28-month in the curriculum. And they sort of begrudgingly and reluctantly agreed, but now are very happy that they did it. Well, let me say, uh, when we teach this class, uh, Jerry and I meet with each student to talk about what kind of, of work they want to do for the semester in relation to their, their future goals for themselves. Lately, when we taught this course, one student hoped to become a dental hygienist. And we sat down together and talked with her and she ended up writing a paper about the nature of smiles, uh, the nature of smiles physiologically, uh, uh, socially, and, uh, and how they're represented in literature. Uh, it turns out Blake has, she found this, Blake has some wonderful poems about smiles. Uh, and she even looked at Poe's uh, um, story, Benner Nietzsche, which is about a man obsessed with his, his uh, wife's teeth. Uh, but the point is, um, uh, uh, this kind of medical humanities opens itself up uh, to drawing interests together, you know. And uh, uh, this, it was a, a particularly nice to have uh, an essay on smiles since we've all been masked up so much. So we haven't been encountering uh, as many smiles as that we need to. But, but that's the kind of thing that a class like this uh, allows for.
Well, I'll ask another question since I don't see any open questions. Um, you know, one of the things that I really um, like, Dr. Vanetta, about your example of the Toni Morrison um, is, uh, and, and I'm going to ask you to speak more explicitly on this, is it, it, because it brings up um, an issue that's a, a serious concern in medicine, which is which is racism. Um, this is something that I talk with my history of medicine students a lot. Um, that you know, there's considerable evidence that um, black people, for example, are undertreated for pain. They're undermedicated, and there's a strong suggestion that kind of predominantly white physicians don't empathize with um, black patients in the way that they they do. So I wondered the extent to which you, you didn't say this explicitly, but it seems to me that that by using pieces of literature like Toni Morrison, you are kind of trying to get students to empathize with a range of people who may not look like them or have the same background or how, to what extent do you talk about that explicitly with um, students? Yes, so um, I can speak to that on two levels. Um, one is sort of the theoretical uh, notion and the second is, is my personal experience. At the theoretical level, I think that um, there's no question that racism is systematic in our society and by nature, of the fact that medicine is part of our society. Racism is embedded in the practice of medicine as well. And so everything that our society is currently uh, struggling with, medicine is too. Um, at the personal level, um, the way I think a book like Beloved helps that fighting that systemic racism is that it, it provides a, a vicarious experience that these young students have not been much associated with. Um, there aren't very many African-American medical students mm -hmm. in America. Um, there are very few at OU. Um, and so um, these students commonly do not have much experience with African American people. And, and so this story, um, which is a remarkable story about slavery, um, uh, gives the student a, vicar a vicarious experience with this group of people that they otherwise wouldn't have. And I think has the potential for opening the door for their further exploration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to this that the humanities bring a focus on cultural experiences uh, that uh, biomedicine doesn't have room for, and for good reason. We want our doctors to know as much biomedicine as possible. So, so in our book, we have a, a, a section on culture and in our classes as well. Uh, one of the things we ask people to read are excerpts from Damon Tweedy's book, Black Man in a White Coat, that, that, that gives a, 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 a actual narratives of, of racism in medicine. Another book we read is, is Anne Fadiman's The Spirit Catch as you right. fall down, yeah. which is an extended case study of the treatment of South Asian Hmong people in California. And it's a wonderful study that talks about how to, to talk about, talk, talk and engage with people who have a different set of cultural values than what you bring to the clinic or to the classroom for that matter. Okay. Uh, 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 Several years ago, I, I wrote a book about pain and suffering, and, and one of the things about pain is that women are simply not treated in the same way as men in terms of pain ailments. And one of the things we talk about in class is that kind of prejudice against um, um, uh, uh, against patients, basically. Uh, and, but the, the larger point is the humanities bring these things, these issues. Uh, uh, to healthcare, and as we all know, there are issues that need to and are starting to be addressed uh, in important ways. I've used the pain and suffering in my own classes, so yeah, <laughs> I remember that. 
I tell my students that they finally got a professor who's the expert <laughs> in pain and suffering. Um, I see a question in the chat, actually. How common is the um, approach or curriculum you propose and to uh, leveraging the humanities to connect with patients in the U.S.? Um, are there other medical programs in the country that have similar programs? So this uh, program, this, this issue of narrative medicine, as Ron pointed out uh, in his introduction, uh, the word narrative medicine was, was coined at Columbia University. And uh, Rita Sharon, who uh, is sort of a combination within herself of Ron and me, she has a PhD in English and she has, uh, she's a general internist. Um, she has created a nar narrative medicine center and she has been working really hard for the past 15 years to educate uh, academics all over the country um, she brings faculty in from all over the country from medical schools uh, and gets them excited about starting something in their own schools. Now, I have not done a survey, so I don't know how many, uh, I don't know how many medical schools are teaching a medical humanities curriculum, but I know that it's increasing. And, and I should add that it's, it's not only in the, in the United States. Uh, right before the, the virus hit, I was invited to go to Denmark to speak on behalf of myself and Jerry about a consortium of European schools that, that want to bring the humanities to medical education. Uh, uh, over the past number of years, I've been to China many times. The, ch uh, the Chinese medical schools are very much interested in figuring out ways, as we all are, of making healthcare more efficient and more satisfying uh, to every everyone involved. So this is a worldwide thing. Uh, I, I have friends in Britain, uh, uh, at Nottingham, for instance. They have a whole. We also presented in Russia. Russia. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so, but the um, um, and just an anecdotally speaking, if I'm on an airplane and start talking about this kind of work with strangers. Everybody's fascinated because everybody's been involved with doctors, uh, and and it's it, it's uh, it, it's something that makes sense on the face of it. Do you find um, any resistance on the part of particularly medical students and kind of you know adding this on to yes. what's an already fairly full curriculum? I, I can answer that with a screaming yes. Um, they are uh, resistant uh, to the idea that this isn't science. Um, uh, in these medical humanities courses that I was mentioning earlier, um, a common experience I've, I've visited with the various faculty that run these different courses um, a, a very, very common experience among these faculty are that the students are highly resistant in the first two or three sessions. And by the time they're halfway through the course, the students are actually say or write that they are looking forward to the class every week and they leave the class almost like they, they, they feel almost like they've been in therapy. So there is, a, there is a stress associated with not only medical education, but the practice of medicine that this, this stuff uh, addresses. And Ron is working with some physicians at the Health Sciences Center on burnout, which is a big topic yeah. in medical education and in the practice of medicine. And one of the ways in which burnout is addressed is uh, through the humanities. Yeah, Ron, would you like to say more about that? I, I'd be, I'm intrigued. Oh, uh, um, you mean about my work with the people? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. I'm working with two physicians uh, um, uh, 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 who, in fact, they have a blog called Resiliency. Uh, and, and I met them as a matter of fact, because one was assigned me as my doctor. Uh, and, and we started talking about other stuff. And then the next thing we know, we meet once a week on Zoom to discuss these matters. Uh, 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 one of the doctors, Dr. LeClaire, uh, is working on uh, um, a, a, a qualitative analysis of, of the stress that members of the healthcare community at OU feel, both students, faculty, physicians, nurses, and, 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 uh, and one of the things that my doctor friends have discovered is that there is this kind of stress in their lives. And what they found is the most salutary thing is ancient philosophy. Huh. Uh, 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 and, and, and they've discovered that the, uh, the notion of moral injury, uh, which is a notion that uh, arose in the military, it's about people who are in a position to do things or, or are forced to do things that they think are morally wrong, uh, can be translated in interesting ways to, to uh, the clinic and to healthcare. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 I think it was a naval officer who began talking about moral injury, began by talking, he was in a Vietnamese um, uh, 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 pr uh, prison camp during the Vietnam War for years, and he talks about what kept him sane as, as a prisoner was reading ancient philosophy, uh, and and what it meant, I think, but we're still working on this, is it creates a sense a sense of centeredness, which the everyday stresses of prison, in his case, or warfare, or the, or, or medicine itself, uh, um, um, uh, 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 gives rise to. One of the things Jerry and I like to talk to in our, with our students is that it's no harder to get an MD uh, than to get a PhD than to get a PhD in English, with one exception. Uh, when you get an MD, you see pain and suffering every day of your life, and, and those in those other areas don't. And that's part of the job and part of what people sign up for, and, and um, the medical humanities allow people to anticipate that better. Mm -hmm. At the medical school interview, no one mentions the fact that you're going to have to face uh, pain and suffering uh, every day uh, after the first two years uh, for the rest of your life. And and um, uh, no one, no one mentions that. So these students are really not very uh, uh, ready for that, and they don't know what to do with it. Uh, but they do find that talking about it and writing about it, as they do in these humanities classes, uh, really helps. I mean, it really is therapeutic. Not only are they learning something, it is therapeutic. I, I should. And over the years, not many, but maybe one or two students a year after taking our class to decide that they don't want to be doctors. Uh, and and I, I, find, I think Jerry joins me, but I find this a very salutary thing because 5% of people who graduate with MDs decide at that point yeah. they don't want to be doctors. And it's a huge expense to them and to our society to train people who don't, don't want to go into it. And one of the things our course does, especially because it's taught by somebody who's been in the trenches like, like, like Jerry, is it gives young people a more realistic sense of what they're getting into than the TV shows they watch. Mm -hmm. When we went to Russia, the, the second question the Russian students asked Jerry was, do you let your students watch ER? <laughs> uh, this is very nice. Because you, uh, you sort of start off really talking about how this approach would will benefit patients, but now you're also talking about how this approach um, benefits physicians and and medical practitioners, um, you know, as as well. Um, yeah, that's yeah, I like that. Dr. Crowther, do we have other questions? I do not see any. Well, um, I might I might answer one that you asked earlier because a, a, another 
another answer just dawned on me. One of the when we when we studied um, when we studied the medical students who took these ten uh, uh, humanities courses, um, and we did a qualitative uh, analysis of their writings. One of the big categories uh, that came out, it was a sort of a meta category, was that having taken these various courses made the students realize that all of this biomedicine, all this science that they are being immersed in um, really actually has a context. And the context is, is in, in fact, these humanities. It's, it's the human element. It's the person, it's the people who are suffering and having these diseases, that's the context in which all of this science begins to make sense. They contextualize uh, why they're doing mm -hmm. this. And I should add, by the way, because uh, we've talked to others about this, students don't need lots of courses. Uh, you know, we teach a one semester course to the undergraduates. Uh, at the Health Science Center, we teach a, a, a three week course to, uh, to, to medical students. Uh, once the light bulb goes off, there's a way of thinking uh, that, and, and it, as Jerry has mentioned, it goes off uh, relatively quickly, mm -hmm. partly because um, um, uh, people committed to healthcare are hungry for this. Kind of thing. That, I mean, I, I think maybe it's uh, easier to reach them earlier as undergraduates, although I, I'm heartened by the fact that you say that medical students, despite you know some initial resistance by and large, kind of like come around to see the, um, the value of this. Um, but uh, it's often kind of like, I, I, I myself often find that um, students have a real, um, pre-med students have a real kind of like hunger to, um, to see this broader context, um, you know, they, they're human beings, they want to relate to other people as human beings, not as, you know, kind of carriers of disease, not, 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 not in purely biomedical terms, but in kind of like human. I terms. think it's the reason I think, I think it's the reason they decided to go to medical school. Uh, usually, uh, people decide to go to medical school at, at the age of 10 to 14. And it's usually in response to to losing someone or having someone very, very close to them who was very, very ill and they felt helpless and, and, and they make a decision to do it. From that point on, they quit thinking about why they did it. They just think about how do I get there? Right. And that's take science courses and make A's. And so this allows us to let them think about why they did it in the first place again mm -hmm. in a deeper in a deeper uh more mature way i feel like in a way they get so socialized out of saying like i want to do this because i want to help people like that that's true that's yeah they're, true. they're not they kind of learn that they're not supposed to say that the medical school socializes it even even greater and yeah. then much more specifically uh, uh students on the wards are often shamed by residents into speaking mm -hmm. that way and, yeah. and the reason for that isn't uh, nefarious. The reason for that is these residents who are working with these students see pain and suffering every day. And one of the things people do, we all do it, is, is to protect themselves from that. Mm -hmm. And one form of protection is dismissal and, 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 and rejection. And that's why the, the work we're talking about is much harder than mm -hmm. it sounds when, when, when we're talking about it. Because because it's a world of suffering that needs um, um, that needs people to face it without succumbing to it. You mentioned Rita Sharon uh, earlier, uh, who invented narrative medicine. Um, Rita commonly says that these humanities or literature is a way to allow and cause the practitioner to engage with the patient, uh, whereas 
medical education teaches them to disengage with the patient. And that's part of the protecting, right. the protecting of themselves from all this, all this loss and death and dying. Um, one way to protect yourself is to disengage. And the reader speaks eloquently about the, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, the benefits of engagement. Mm -hmm. She says it comes with sorrow and, and, and stress, but it also comes with this, uh, a sense of working in the world. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it also seems like you're suggesting that that kind of trying to turn off the emotions and to disengage doesn't really work in the end. And right. um, you need to find a way to, um, you know, to engage without being kind of overwhelmed. And one by way we should add, the, the, I should the, add it doesn't work is so many doctors hate their jobs. Mm -hmm. One of our Rhodes Scholars, uh, 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 who's now practicing medicine uh, in the Northern State, uh, told me when she was uh, 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 um, starting medical school, every doctor she spoke to told her she should do something <laughs> else. Uh -uh. I mean, I mean, that, that's a remarkable thing, uh, 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 and 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 part of our job in the health, in the health humanities is to make doing healthcare less uh, hateful, really. Well, I I see we have just a couple minutes left. So, are there any any questions from the attendees or? Any final comments you want to leave us with? I'll just leave you with this comment. Listening to us talking together should show you how much fun this is. <laughs> <laughs> it does make me want to take one of your classes. <laughs> um, well, as we seem, uh, okay, so uh, there's a question, can these courses be taken outside of the honors program? Oh, uh, and the answer is yes. In the last few years, I've been teaching it in arts and sciences. Okay. Uh, um, uh, and when we taught it in the <laughs> honors program, and when we still teach it, we always leave, we always leave three or four slots for people that we can invite in who aren't in honors. Uh, 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 and, uh, and for obvious reasons. Uh, okay. Okay, I, I see we're coming up on one o'clock. So um, I'd like to thank you both for, for a really stimulating conversation um, on a, you know, obviously um, really important topic. Um, and to thank the uh, attendees for coming. And uh, uh, again, I note there's a, in the, you can find in the chat um, a link to the whole webinar series if you are um, interested. So I think I guess at this point I can I can wish everyone a, a good afternoon and and and, and thank, thank you guys. You.